Uh, our last presentation today is Hillary and Joanne. They're going to share their module on hydrologic droughts with us. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm going to start off. Joanne will take over from me. Uh, so I have just got a few slides to start off. Um, and then we'll switch over and show you the module itself. So this is our module uh, title. So it's we, we need to change it a little actually compared to what it's uh, on the hydrolone at the moment, but it's gonna be called Hydrologic Droughts and Drying Rivers. Uh, and so the motivation um, for this module is um, something like this slide, which I um, asked my students to think about early in my hydrology classes. So imagine that you've been called in as a hydrology expert um, and the county water management board want to know, we're worried that low flows in our river are getting more extreme. Is it true? What are the risks? Um, and I asked them to think about what kind of data and information they need to answer this question. So this is the kind of um, question that we'd like the students to be able to answer um, after they finish our module. Um, so, we, in terms of the aims of the module, in very simplified terms, we want the students to be able to do three things after they finish, them, finish the module. Um, so, to be able to use common drought terms and know what they mean. Um, to be able to quantify low flows in a river and quantify how they change over time. Um, and to be able to visualize and communicate um, their results. So, we turn these simple aims into the learning objectives that we have um, for the module. Um, so they're kind of divided into three parts. So the first two are more simple ones about the um, defining the common drought terms. So we want the students to be able to say whether a situation is a, a meteorological drought, agricultural, hydrologic or societal drought. And we want them to be able to define the concepts of magnitude, frequency and duration as we use them to define droughts. We then have two um, higher level objectives, which are more about processing the data to be able to understand how low flows change over time. Um, and we then have a final objective, um, which is at a higher level where the students um, present the work that they've done and um, use different visualization techniques um, to describe how droughts have been changing. Um, so in terms of the structure of our module, then this is how it looks like. Um, so it's basically got a background section. It's then got two sections on low flow indices and flow duration curves where the students are, are working with, um, with data and processing it. And then it's got a final section on visualizing and communicating their work. Um, so unlike, I guess, other, the other modules that we saw earlier, then we don't use one specific case study, but throughout the module, we're inviting the use their own river that they're interested in and download their own data and then work with that data. So then hopefully if you do this in a class, then you end up with a nice variety of different uh, watersheds that the students have worked with. Um, so I'm going to talk about the first two sections briefly and then Joanne will um, introduce the second two sections. So just to give you an overview here. So this is their background section, um, learning about the drought terms. Um, and then this is the first of the two quantitative sections where they're going to calculate various low flow um, indices for the, for the river. So index, a low flow index is things like um, what's the number of days per year where the river was at a zero flow, something like that. So like a quantitative way of saying how low the river flows are. Um, so they're going to do that in two ways. They're going to um, use the eFlows tool, which is actually something that Belize uh, has been involved in um, developing. Um, but it's a really nice web tool where they can upload data from their watershed and then automatically calculate various indices. Um, and then the second part is that they're going to write, write some of their own indices. So this helps them to actually see what's going on behind the scenes of a tool like eFlows um, and actually process some of their own data just using a spreadsheet. Um, and then they have an assessment to write that up. And then the second part that um, Joanne will talk to you about is about using flow duration curves, which visualize the cumulative distribution function um, of river flows and how they change. And then the part about um, visualizing and communicating their results. Um, so I'll just switch over to, oh, except I can't work this technology. <laughs> I'll switch over to the module. Okay, so ho hopefully you can see this um, module now. So here's our module and this is the um, 
background section. And so the background section, if I expand those, um, you can see that um, these have the same um, kind of outline so that it introduces the student to the topic. There's a short check your understanding quiz and then a, a learning activity, which basically asks them to do a reading um, and then um, produce either a discussion post or a short um, discussion um, with their partner. And then here's the other section on low flow um, indices. Um, and if I expand these, um, you can see that they, in, each one has an introduction and then some tutorials and then a learning activity. And I'll just show you this first one as, as an example. Um, so here's their introduction to the um, low flow indices using the eFlows tool. So it gives them a lot of background data, steals one of the um, pictures from the website to um, what they're going to achieve. Um, and then if we go next, then throughout the module, we used various different ways um, of, uh, sh of explaining the methods to the students. But in this case, then I've created some video tutorials so they can follow along while I um, go through the activities and then they can see what they're doing and it, tell it shows them how to um, process the data um, into the spreadsheet. Um, and then at the end, there's a learning activity, um, which asks them to have been through these um, um, activities and they can write up their results, shows them some supporting data, asks them to compare their results with, a, with another student. Um, and I think I will go back to the course. I can't see the chat, but I think I got a five minute warning. So I will pass over to uh, Joanne to introduce the second two parts of the module. Okay. Um, Joanne, do you want me to drive the screen or do you want to take over? Uh, yeah, you can drive if you want. Okay. So uh, the flow duration curves module um, is structured similar, but a little bit different uh, to Hillary's in that what I've done with the check your understanding is put them in the, the first two, the first few sections where they're learning about things. And then later on, um, then uh, the, uh, you know, they actually do the activity. So, uh, you know, one thing I was finding was there were so many different pages for students to go to that I wanted to sort of combine them into one page. Uh, we can look at a sample interpreting um, and uh, we're, we have two case studies over here. Um, and one of the sort of take home messages for students is you can have rivers in a very humid climate like Florida and these rivers uh, can be drying due to, in this case, uh, human activities. And so the Silver River is a spring-fed river, and uh, Hillary is going down and showing kind of some of the story and graphics. So it actually doesn't have any measurable drainage area because it's fed by groundwater. And so we uh, have some sample flow uh, duration curves of this, and then the other river, which is the Apalachicola River, which has a large watershed. We talk about the difference between plotting on a um, arithmetic and a logarithmic axis, and a little bit about how to interpret this with a check your understandings at the bottom. Um, you can go do the Apalachicola next, I guess. And so here we, you know, we have a reservoir and central pivot irrigation, and we have some uh, nice graphics that just show, you know, people that they're, they're, this is a different area. We have the, you know, flow duration curves. We get students thinking about, you know, which type of graph shows the data the best, um, and then some questions at the bottom. And then they actually do a flow duration curve, a dimensionless flow duration curve, and a comparative flow duration curve. And let's go to um, maybe a comparative flow duration curve, um, just interpret, I guess. And um, yeah, just interpreting, constructing, and then we'll go to constructing too. So, you know, in this comparative, I want to present the idea that uh, once the, the flow regime changes, in many cases due to regulation, like putting in a reservoir dam, um, then you have an echo deficit or echo surplus. And so students will interpret this on the Apalachicola River, where we have a big deficit 
from before to after for most of this comparative um, period of time. Both of these are about, you know, 30 or more years of record. Um, and then I let them know too that you can also have a big difference if you're looking at stage. And here I've actually looked at three time periods in this graph. And so they get the idea of how this can be applied, this method, and why you would want to pick certain breakpoints and how you can how you can go ahead and do that. Um, and so in the learning activity over here, you know, I've listed the steps and then at the bottom, um, go to the very bottom. Um, yeah, we have, I have a section called stuck and there's a, 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 an Excel spreadsheet that students can look at an example. And this is in all of the, the modules over here, just so students can see, okay, your data are supposed to look like this. So um, anyway, um, let's go to the stripes and strips, I guess, next. And um, so this is, uh, start with stripes, I guess. And so the idea behind this as um, this is an idea that was adapted from the climate stripes, which is a communication mechanism of trying to show um, that the world is warming uh, through colors. And so you can see the blues changing to reds. And so I'm applying the same method to stream flow. So um, we go next. And so here I have two case studies of these two rivers that they've seen before, the Silver River in Florida and the, um, um, the uh, Apalachicola River. And this is both with mean annual flow, but there's also an example below that with a minimum annual flow if students want to extract further. And then you can really see the drying and so why we have water wars with Apalachicola and Georgia and, and Alabama. Although I don't get too much into that in this at all. Um, let's go to um, you know the, uh, the next one, I guess. And so here uh, for the learning activity. My part's over, I'm just trying to be a good guy with somebody else. What's the question? Okay, so anyway, um, through, um, we have instructions, we have ideas on how students can pick their own station by looking at where's the most irrigation, where's the most war use, all these kinds of federal links. Um, there's a video that a student made about how to do, or she, a, a young woman, I don't know if she's a student on how to make climate stripes in Excel. And that's one of the, you know, uh, guides for the students that was on YouTube, but I also have a specific how to make stream flow stripes. Um, and then go a little further. I've uh, also encouraged them to make this a background template that looks like this and then they plop their stream flow stripe on top of something like this so they can actually do time rather than just a series of stripes. Um, so let's go to the next one, which is the heat map or the strips. I call it stripes and strips because they sound, uh, it kind of goes together. And so the idea here is, um, yeah, let's go to the first one. So they learn a little bit more about the application of heat maps. And, you know, one application, of course, is hydrology. And so I've created this, uh, what, what other people would call a heat map. But again, the blue is the wet periods and the browns are the dry periods. And as you're going through, you know, 80 or so years of data, you can see this big chunk of dryness starting in 2000 due to, you know, taking more and more water of the aquifer that's, uh, you know, the river is getting less flow overall. And so just a few questions about interpreting this graph. And then um, the learning activity is actually creating this themselves. And this is a little bit more complicated. It can be done in Excel or Google Sheets. I give them the instructions in Excel and I give them again, they have a, a help at the bottom or if they're stuck, they can see a sample sheet of how to do this. But this is a little bit more complicated because they have to use the VLOOKUP function um, and set up a couple of different grids to create this. 
And uh, so in this case, they're much more likely to actually need resources. This video is, uh, you know, somewhat related. It's kind of making a, a annual uh, heat map from weekly data. And so it's not the identical project, but there's enough information in here that students also can see where the connection is. And again, I have a worked example over here. And then the final project, oh, I got a, there's two stucks in there. <laughs> I got stuck on stuck, I guess. I'll delete that. And uh, bottom line is at the end, they pull together this narrated visual synthesis and they're the water manager trying to talk to stakeholders in this activity. And they're choosing from graphics that they made or that they can create, um, you know, of a particular stream system that they have a, a case study. And there is a, a, a video over here about how to give a strong presentation, like having a strong introduction and, you know, having a take home message and those types of things. Um, but they actually have latitude about, you know, what materials they want to put together that should come from this um, material here. And, you know, there's a rubric. Okay, so, Joanne, maybe we can um, give some time for questions because we only have okay. a few minutes left. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Just like to hear what other folks think about it or if there's any suggestions for how we can improve it. Um, I'll stop my share because I can't see the chat if it's while I'm sharing. I've got a question. I, I really yeah. like this module. I, I could see myself using it in my hydrology course. Um, with the Apalachicola example, um, is there any discussion on the, the impacts on the ecology of the area and um, just, you know, thinking about the context, because I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, Apalachicola was was part of that tri-state water wars and, oh, there, yeah, somebody's posted a link there. The, yeah, it is, and uh, there's a lot of one, uh, there's a lot of resources on that, so it's a question of how deep I want to get into it, um, because it's uh, interesting information, but it's not the you know so yeah i can i can enhance that but uh that's uh i've actually published multiple papers on the apalachicola in recent years i have some epa funding right now and and so i'm working on that issue and know a lot about it and i don't want to get too too deep into it because i'm not sure how, how deep the students from california want to get into a florida water problem yeah i'm probably pretty biased because i'm in alabama here so Okay. And I like, I, I like, I like seafood too. And I know a lot of the shellfish are, are affected by that too. Yeah. Yeah. The oyster, the whole, um, you know, um, there's a moratorium right now on actually harvesting oysters till 2025. And, um, you know, the, there's a lot of, um, right now, Georgia is in a sense winning the water war because unless we can prove economic ex economic damage of a serious degree, then they pretty much have total leeway according to the last case about, you know, water consumption. So. so I just moved from Atlanta and work, my research group helped facilitate the stakeholder group meetings um, on the water wars. But so we have Georgia, Florida, and Alabama here. Yeah, we do. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know, uh, different, I mean, there are different issues in each area, you know, uh, Georgia wants water for economic growth of Alabama too. Florida is mostly concerned with preserving the ecosystems. Um, uh, the upper Apalachicola is the highest area of biodiversity in the entire United States. So, you know, um, any water taken away can do serious damage to that. Um, we have an, a question, yeah, uh, Hillary. Yeah, I'm, I'm answering some questions in the chat. So just, <laughs> um, we had a question about the, yeah, the Q710 flows, which is one of the flows that's used for pollution control, basically kind of um, estimates the minimum flow that you're likely to see uh, in, the, in the river, um, which the students actually do calculate themselves use, using the Google Sheets, because that's one that's, that's quite possible for them to do themselves. Although I would have to say that this, also causes a few problems because many of the streams that they may 
uh, choose, they might dry up totally at some point, in which case you just get a zero value there, or they have missing data of some description, which um, messes up when you're trying to calculate absolute minimums. So um, it, it does cause a few problems, but we encourage the students to check out their data carefully before calculating these indices. And I think we'll also need to talk to them about the suitability of different indices for different places and for solving different problems. Right, and I have them also look for missing data and, you know, not go ahead at some point if they have too much of it. Um, and somebody asked about, oh, here we go, how much probability or stats background? Um, not, there's not very much that is involved um, here, I guess. I'm just trying to think what they need to know. Um, uh, I had to introduce them to return periods for things like the Q710 so that um, they need to know how to estimate those. So I provided a little bit of background on that. Maybe Joanne, you can speak to, did you provide some background on what is a CDF before they get into flow duration curves? Um, you know, very basic details about the, and maybe I could, that could be an area that I could actually enhance if we, uh, you know, in our revisions. So this is the feedback process, but uh, I, you know, I do, I did describe what the purpose of it was and what it, what it was essentially, but we can go and, you know, if someone thinks I should really go take a deeper dive or explain more, that's something we can do at this revision stage. 